meeting for uh, November 3rd, 2020 to one of the first items on the agenda is the a sign on the mobile station at 142 East Market Street. And I think everybody got a copy of the sign documents. It's a little, uh, a little yes. it's a little flag sticking off the pole above from the pump. Is a representative from Station Glow here? Yes, it is. It's, my name is uh, Eric Battis, E-R-I-C-B-A-T-T-I-S. Um, did you guys start already? I just got in. Yeah, we, we, just, we just started one, one, one minute ago. Okay. All right, yeah. So what we are uh, presenting is uh, two uh, feeling apertures over one blade over each pump. Um, they'll both be hanging off the one canopy pole that is on site. Over here. <clears throat> and the, uh, the square footage was okay for the sign? No, I don't believe so. No, I don't think so either. I think uh, the application had already been um, non compliant prior. Please. Brian, do you have the, uh, the sign calculation page that you could bring up? Yes, I do. Um, just one minute. So, building frontage is 50, 25 square feet of sign. Where is, what is the sign calculation for the mobile station? Yeah, remind me, Ryan, about this application, please. Uh, they were in compliance. Uh, they have enough. So existing right now is 16 square feet to total of what um, is there now. What they're proposing is six square feet in total for right. two of these. Right. Two of these uh, to be okay. uh, bolted to the canopy column. And they will be over the pump, I believe. Eric, are these double-sided? <clears throat> uh, they're both double-sided, correct. Okay, so they're going to be double-sided. They're going to be over each pump. Um, and so... Go back 16, to the calculation. 16 minus 6 is 10 or, or 9 or so, so they have 9 square feet re uh, remaining. But if okay. you multiply 2.83 times 0. 0.66, 1.84, that's under 2 times 2, it's under 4, not 6. And those aren't accurate either, because if you look at the measurements, the, the width and height of the sign is much more than 1.84 square feet. It's 40 plus inches by 14 point plus inches, which gets you closer to 8 square foot than 6 square foot. <clears throat> All right. What do you, plus so go, plus the, the existing signs are not 16 square feet. If you go out there, I didn't bring a tape measure or anything, but the mobile sign, um, you know, it's about 18 square feet. My guess, the, the, uh, the prices are something closer to 10 and the, the big round Pegasus must be at least, uh, you know, 18 or 20. So, so there it's are seen over signs if you measure them all. And they just, they don't have the measurements for the existing signs here. Yeah, for some reason I thought prior to this application that the already existing signage had already exceeded. That was for the fairgrounds mobile site, John. That was for their other site that they were applying for at the fairgrounds. Okay, okay, so we removed them. So we sent them a denial letter for that. Um, and uh, the uh, representative at Station Glow, uh, this individual here, Kara Ken Kennedy, was satisfied with that and was going to let the owners know. Um, and then we were going off of the information that we were given here for the existing signage. So obviously someone did not do their due diligence. So, um, so this appears to be a... a um 
an application that probably should be denied. Um, right. We're looking, no. so we don't have any accurate numbers on the mobile sign. And Correct. Then what, is, so, what is, yeah. So Eric, are yes. you still on, on the line? So Eric, so am, yep. uh, what you need to inform uh, Kara is that um, the owners can either uh, reapply for a variance okay. if they wish to pursue um, the new uh, signage here for the synergy or if um, they want to take a different route. Well, we got to let's let's be clear. So the thing is, we don't even have accurate numbers. Um, just so I don't know if you're familiar with the calculation of signage. But if you look at this application, you have a builded frontage of 50. So you take that linear feet and you divide it by two, 25 feet is the most allowable square footage you're allowed at that site. So deduct, so you got to accurately calculate what you already have there, deduct it, which I'm, I'm assuming it's already exceeding 25. Um, so for starters, we have to get that number. And then, and then it looks like your proposed signage, um, like John Clark mentioned, you know, is pretty off. You know, you, you're, you're talking 40 inches, which, you know, is definitely go, no, go back down. Or, right, okay, so you're talking, is that 40 inches, right? Yeah. yeah. So those numbers are pretty um, inaccurate. Yeah, I will. Uh, she obviously filled all this out, but yeah, I can see that she's uh, messed up here a little bit. And I'll go back to her with this. And, and this, this sign needs to be near, over a yard long. That's that's going to be a huge sign. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't. Well, the thing is, I don't know if they're even going to be able to get to that point because they're going to need a variance for the existing signage, on top of whatever additional signage they're going to want. So. You know, I don't want to speculate, but I don't even know what kind of numbers we're talking about. And, and what is this pink arrow in the middle? That's that, just that just shows what it views from the other side when you're looking straight at it. Oh, okay. David. That's a side elevation. If, okay. if you want to see what this actually looks like, if you go up to the mobile station at the 9 and 9G intersection in the town of Rhinebeck, uh, they have them installed there. As, as an example. So, um, Another solution might be to, to take away some unnecessary signage or reduce some. Um, so that, you know, the big flying horse sign, I'm not sure that that has a lot of identifier value compared to the big mobile sign. So, you know, if you want to put in a new sign, you might want to take away some signage and, and that might uh, be a way in which you can convince us that this sign doesn't go over what's already there. Yeah, you understood. All right, Eric. So I think you have some uh, relaying to do uh, with Kara, yep. and uh, I can follow up with her tomorrow. All right. Thank you very much. So we'll thank table you. this till they come back to us. Okay, the second and last item on the agenda is uh, 36 Mulberry Street. And uh, David, you're going to come back with a a design. Actually, I think this was our suggestion. Um, Hi, we're out. here. We can't oh, seem okay. to put our, our our visual on. That's okay. We know what you okay. look like. Okay. <laughs> so, so we had suggested to, to line up the hot tub with the bathroom ex extension, and we had questions about the pergola, which is eliminated. So. I, I don't see much of a problem with the, the three foot variance that you're requesting. Um, does anybody, would anybody like to talk about it? I don't see anything wrong with it. The, the only question you're gonna get, you know, is whether the hot tub can't be moved closer to the house. Um, why does it have to be six or whatever it is feet from the house, couldn't it be moved a little closer? That question the ZBA might ask you and you should be prepared to answer it. Okay. Yeah, but does anybody else have any questions about it? Wasn't that about privacy or screening from the house yeah. so you'd feel isolated there? Yes, yes Mary. The house <clears throat> yes, Mary. Yeah, 
yeah, that makes sense. You know, I can understand the bathroom, that's where it is because it's fixed to the house, but the tub is sort of a free floating element, could be a couple of feet shorter to the house and, and uh, reduce the variance. And that's a question that the ZPA will commonly ask, can you reduce the variance? So just okay. either be prepared with a good answer on that one. All right, thank you, John. So um, if, if nobody has any more questions, can I have a, uh, a positive or negative recommendation to the ZBA for this variance of 36 Mulberry Street? I'll do a positive recommendation. Um, based on the, uh, the narrowness of the rear yard uh, to the house and the need for, um, and the fact that it doesn't exceed the existing uh, garage, which is already close to the back uh, property line. And as I remember it, there's a fence along this property line that would give screening from the neighbors. And, yes. and the house of the neighbors is not very close to this property line. So all those reasons I think are justified for, for um, giving a positive recommendation. All right, so Christy will get that all in the uh, form. I guess Ryan, you have to show her how to fill out a ZBA or will you fill that out? Um, uh, the, the stuff to give to Colton about the positive recommendation. So do we have a second? I'll second that. Uh, I have a roll call vote. Uh, Mary Quinn. Aye. Michael D. Aye. John Clark. Aye. James Davidson. Aye. David Miller. Aye. It passes the positive recommendation. So Ryan, we'll see that that gets written up and given to Colton for the ZBA meetings. So guys, just be prepared to explain or maybe accommodate the ZBA as they could be a little further back from the fence. But as we said, John covered all the reasons we talked about last time. And no one can see. You have privacy because no one is, no house or backyard of anybody is anywhere near the bathroom and hot tub. Bringing some photographs of the backyard yes. um, might help as well, because you really can't see it from Google. So Google Maps, so, you know, having some photographs back there to show how narrow it is and what you want to do, even if you have stakes in the ground so that you can show where the bathroom would be or whatever. Okay, um, thank those will be helpful to the ZBA. Right. And I'm, okay. I'm glad you figured out a way to do this and proceed with it. So good luck. And uh, I guess you'll be back. For, uh, <laughs> We're always approval. coming back. You can't get rid of us. <laughs> 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 yes. Thank All right, guys, all. take it easy. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye -bye. So we have two excellent sets of minutes from, from Chrissy Imey. And uh, we had uh, August 18th. I didn't, I didn't see anything with August 18th. I think she did a very good job. Anybody have any comments about August 18th? The content was just fine. I don't have it in front of me. There were a couple little, um, you know, uh, typos or whatever, but it was, it was fine. All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of August 18th, 2020. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The minutes of September 1st, I'm glad we're catching up. Um, on page, the only thing I saw was on page three, Ryan, in the, the, the first paragraph, Chairman Miller asked the CEO, John Fenton, one, two, three, four, the fifth line down in the middle, Chairman Miller stated that the property owner should be reminded that he must pay the lot. So the word owner was missing. But other than that, I, I didn't see anything that we can't live with in these minutes either. I got it. Okay, all right. Uh, any other questions? All right, I'll make a motion to approve the September 1st, 2020 minutes. Do we have a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Mike Jeopardy here. Michael wins the buzzer. We need to get buzzers. Michael wins. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anything else that anybody wants to talk about? Um, 
I see Mace has paved his parking lot. It looks nice. Wow. And That's exciting. There's no, no, no indication of his garbage enclosure yet. So I like us to kind of stay on top of that. Yeah. And, and what's the story with um, Chesney's parking? Seems like they. Hey, well, we reached out to him. He hasn't contacted us. Okay. Um, you know, we'll give him a few more days, possibly a week, and then um, then I have to send out an order to remedy. Yeah. More than likely, the silence means attorney. So maybe, yeah. I'm so almost we bad. did we did reach out to him. Uh, we wanted some type of feedback or at least an explanation. It seems to be from my observations that. The uh, parking lot is being used by employees of uh, Mirabu because I'm seeing them come in there and then they leave and they go right over there and they're they're there for you know. No, that's it. That's accurate because I reached yeah. out to Ed Kellogg. Yeah. And he he basically um, admitted that that is the case. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with 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 the park. I actually think it's very good. It's just that our precedent is that when you you know you got a parking lot or any kind of commercial activity up against residential that it needs to be screened. And those par those cars park, so their lights are flashing right into 10 Oak Street. So. Right, right. It needs and fencing or screening or something, That that's all. Yeah, yeah. yep. But um, we'll keep reaching out to him. We already made the attempt. He's aware of it. He just hasn't called us back, so. Yeah. So yeah. One, one comment about the historic district. Um, uh, we are from Albany. It has been approved, and we are now on the district has been expanded, and we are now on the state historic register. And they have sent the material to Washington D.C. Parks Department to get us on the national historic register. But for us, I guess I want to clarify this with John because the mayor called me the other day to talk about it. The district has been created. We have that copy, that very fuzzy map with the red added to it. I just wrote that Jennifer Betts was saying, could we have a clear, sharp map of the new historic district? And some couple of questions came up. Uh, I never saw the letter. Jennifer sent out some uh, pamphlets about explaining why it's wonderful to be in a district. You can get um, uh, your price of your house goes up and you can get uh, grants to renovate historic structures. So it's a good thing to be on. But I never saw the letter that went out saying, do you, do you or do you not want to be on? Apparently a couple of people said no. I don't know how many, the mayor didn't say. But apparently Jennifer said, told the mayor that the way it works is that unless 51% of the people say no, it, it becomes law. So we're in the historic district now. And even if you opt out, I assume, John, by our law, um, if you're in the historic district, you fall under the guidelines whether or not your house is on the historic register is what I'm assuming. I, I got that letter being on Platt, Platt Avenue. And, what um, did it say? Well, uh, pretty much what you outlined uh, that, 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 you know, if, if you, you had a chance to opt or vote against being in it, at, uh, and, but if 51% so it's of residents said that. Yeah, it said that, and, and then we got a follow-up letter not too many weeks ago, it's the last couple of weeks saying, you know, you are, we are now part of the expanded district and uh, mentioning some of the benefits that you've just outlined. Um, so uh, obviously more than 51% opted in. And I don't, I don't think you can, you know, I, my sense was you can't unilaterally opt out just because you were against the. Right. And by our law, if you're in the historic district, like we had the issue with that, front yard parking on Montgomery Street. They wanted to fix up the garage and stuff. And it's a modern house. It's listed on the historic register as an intrusion, but that's the National Historic Register. I'm trying to understand the, law, the legal business between the National Historic Register and the village historic district, which mm -hmm. we have the local law for the village historic district. So we told if they wanted to do the garage on Montgomery Street, they had to have you know, vertical windows, et cetera, et cetera, and follow the rules for the historic district. So um, 
even I saw they started work on 12 Chestnut Street, which we approved some time back there. And that's listed as a, it's in the historic register. It's, it's on the historic register, but it's listed as a 1945 modern intrusion in 1979. Now it could be, in 50 years, could be considered a historic building. So uh, the mayor was going to call John, I think, and, and I asked him to call Mike Frazier. He might have remembered what happened in 1979 when the original district was created, but it is now expanded. And I, I asked Jennifer Betsworth for clear maps of the new historic district so we can get it to everybody, so we can uh, publicize it, everybody can see the new district, and we can know where we are with that. So we've added 100. I also have to get some, from somebody the pages. Remember, whenever you look at the Consortium of Rhinebeck History, you can see the individual pages for the historic register. Mm -hmm. I need to get the pages from Jennifer or from Neil Larson, so we can get them to our webmaster and put them up on our website so people can look at them. Uh, so that's as far as I know. The mayor was going to find some more information, but. Yeah, I, I was just looking at the historic district section article eight in the zoning law and it says um, that properties listed in the United States Department of Interior's National Register of Historic Places um, this HDLO includes all the properties in the Rhinebeck Village Historic District, and then it adds a few more. Um, and then later it says the trustees may designate Historic District and Landmark Protection Measures and amend the boundaries and properties of the HDLO and map at any time. So the question to the attorney is, if it goes on the National Register, if it's approved at the federal level, does it automatically go in the HDO based on that paragraph? Or does the, the village trustees have to amend the law and add it separately? Yeah, that's what I don't, I don't know, John Fenton. I don't know. Um, yeah. If, if, that's the, if that's now passed, is that the new village historic district and does that now fall under the our local law HDO um, uh, we have to ask somebody. I believe it does, but I'll confirm. I believe it does too. That, that's what I thought the intention of the law was. Um, and that um, we're, and also David, just so you know, um, the mayor and I are trying to get into a, have a meeting with Jennifer. Um, so we can ask that question as well. I mean, well, that, that, that's not her bailiwick, but I can also help John look into this. Yeah. What, what in God's name is a bailiwick? Bailiwick. Bailiwick. <laughs> Bailiwick. It's like Jim oh, Jack. It's an old, it's a. Oh, okay. All right. A, yeah, yeah, sort of like, you know, like that pilot. Area, perimeter. Yeah. Perimeter. It's a, so, but, but I thought, but David, I, that's what I ultimately thought the primary uh, purpose of the uh, law was to expand the historic district. So other projects, you know, new construction or major, you know, additions couldn't go on without site plan approval. I, I think that, yes, I think the separate issue, the village historic district and being on the national register may not right. be the same thing. And the local law that we have for the HDO, we have to talk about no aluminum or vinyl siding, blah, 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 um, uh, is our local law which is which has nothing to do with being on the historic register. Well, it does because it the does law, indirectly, but yeah, it's just whether it automatically happens or whether they actually have to go through a public hearing process and amend the, the district well, boundaries locally. No, in the I found I, I was digging after I spoke to the mayor. I found from two and a half years ago the original contract that was signed with Neil Lawson, and the end of it, the last couple of lines say. He, as part of this contract, will preside over a public hearing in front of two public hearings in front of the village board uh, and explaining the historic district to the public. And that didn't happen. No, they had one. We, we went to it. You and me were at that, David. Was that? That was yes. a public hearing to explain it to the public. I, I recall that. Yes, yes, you're right. We did have one. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people came. Yeah, well, there was a fair amount. There was maybe 20, 25. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't see that. I would have liked to gone, but that meeting probably was about putting it on the National Register. It, uh, it wasn't about putting it in the local law. H historic district overlay zone. Right. 
but Jennifer sent out the new, and said now that red, those three red areas are now black. They're live. Okay. Well, so, our, our code is tied to the national register, so it has to be approved at the federal level before it becomes um, codified. Yeah, becomes eligible under our law. We need to get a legal opinion from some of you, Craig Wallace or somebody, John, I don't know who, but. Um, I, th I believe Olson's been working on it. Or I gotta, Olson. Yeah. S someone to clarify. to make Yeah, we'll check into that. Chicken and egg, you know, which comes first. Yeah, all right. And I can't um, believe that if some of those houses on Platt are National Register eligible, the, the old school, Burke Buckley School is not National Register eligible as well. Yeah, but they, but they, it's like uh, 12 Chestnut Street, which is under renovation now. And it came before the planning board because they're in the historic district. And they're on the historic register, but listed as a 1945 modern intrusion. Right. In but the point is that this should be updated for the HDL, uh, for the historic properties. He, he, uh, I haven't seen the results. That's why I want to see all the results. He supposedly reevaluated the, the 400 old houses, as well as the 100 and some new houses. Right. So I need to get in, in um, there are 377, I think, listed uh, on our website. And then there's the 2012 reevaluation Marilyn Hatch did. And that's a second column. I now want to add a third column, 2020 reevaluation plus the 100 and some new houses. So we have it all up on the web, people to look at. So I need to get the raw data from Jennifer or Neil Larson or somebody. Because I don't know what he said. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall it coming back as a completed um, amendment to the code. You know, so I don't we'll know look into board, it. Does the village board have to pass? The yeah, or is they have, it well, they have to, I didn't think that was, that process had been completed. I don't know. Well, as long as Rich Olson's looking at it, somebody has to look at it. But I, I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. I mean, okay. j j just to be clear on the law, if we, um, just because it's on the state or the federal, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be on the village. So if we want to add it to the village historic district, then we would need to do that via the code. Um, I can get Rich Olson to give it, I mean, I can work with John and getting Rich Olson to give us an opinion on that, but just because the state and the feds rule on it doesn't mean necessarily that the village has to. But I think at some point we signed a paper that we agree to go along with this. I, 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 I think there was a question asked that we want, that the village board had a, had a vote that they approve going ahead with this process or something, and a letter was sent to Jennifer Betsworth I, this I, most recent, this most recent one with the expansion. Yeah, yeah, I think okay. it was primarily focusing on the expansion of just our district map. Nothing really, no verbiage actually in the code itself. It was just the, um, the historic okay. district overlay being codified and labeling the additional streets and parcels. So okay. I need to know what is if someone on Platt Avenue wants to comes to the Ryan and wants right. to change their house is it is it an historic district yet i would say no i'd no. say no not until That'd we accept codified. it yeah, yeah. Okay. um so we need to figure yeah. something out yeah but getting an answer on that i think is important yeah yes. moving fast on it because there might be some people who try to beat the gun with an application right. especially given that there's a few people who have um who are upset about the designation so I, I don't know why our law is not, it's like three or four pages long, it's not an onerous law. Um, we don't even do paint colors. <laughs> they do in most places. Um, it's really just windows and aluminum siding. And But no one's no. come in in all these years and said, I want to rip off the front porch and put in two giant picture windows. No one's, <laughs> no one's well, thank that, goodness. You know, so. <laughs> Okay, anything else anybody would like to talk about? We can go watch the, the uh, non-election results. Uh, yes, I got a question. I got a question for John Fenton. The Art of Building is working on uh, South Street on the house right behind the Dutch Reform Cemetery. Is cemetery. that anything that's, did they get a building permit or anything or? Yes, they did. Yeah, 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Ryan and I pulled out the file about a week ago and we did our research on it. They had approval back in 2018, Ryan? That's a separate one, John. That's a separate Mike, location. Mike's, re, Mike's re, uh, referring to 7 South Street. Yeah. Which would be I right behind. Right uh, behind they, the cemetery. Yeah, they pulled a separate permit for that. It's all interior reno okay. and uh, kitchen uh, upgrade. There's nothing right. to okay. the outside. Okay, okay, sorry. 73 was a little complicated, but 7, yeah. Okay. And um, on Livingston Street, I don't know. It's the purple house that they, you know, the 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 big house with the they're putting in a new um, bluestone sidewalk in front of it. And it looks nice. The only problem is it looks it it immediately is like looks like it's about three foot stones. The dimension a, the dimensions are okay. They're not as they're not the typical type um, that's there now, but um, they are code compliant. Okay. The only thing what's going to happen is now it's going to, it's going to start a chain reaction because mm -hmm. all the other sidewalks east and west of that are going to need to now come into compliance. But um, I mean, I it's, think it's I nice think looking, but it looks smaller. I mean, it, 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 you know, the ones on both sides are, I don't know, four or so. And then all of a sudden it cuts down to three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The minimum is 36 inches. Okay. Uh, which is required. I uh, thought it was four feet, so that's why I was asking. So Yeah, a lot of the older ones were four feet. I think the uh, New York State Code, I have heard, is in the process of upgrading that to four feet, which is I think right? is necessary because three feet is really too narrow. It but is. I don't know if it's official right. yet. I just heard that, that they were in the process. Oh, boy. I mean, you know, it only makes sense. You know, 36 is a little tight. So we're meeting in two weeks. Ryan, is the hotel coming back? Have they cleared up all their issues yet? Or are we still I, I received from I received an email from uh, their engineer, and uh, he will be submitting uh, the next set of updated plans uh, this week. Um, I know there was something supposed to happen this week with Meg Crawford as chair of the Tree Commission with uh, the proposed uh, plantings for the hotel. Um, I think the details need to be worked out on that. So I'll be following up with uh, the engineer and uh, Meg about that. Um, as far as I know, uh, you sh all should have received uh, the notification from DOT that they gave uh, the hotel sort of the green light that really they don't need to do anything extra beyond filing a permit, you know, when they begin the project. Um, and then I guess the only other um, item that needs to be delivered on is the communication between um, the frontier and the applicant. And I did remind Craig Wallace about that. I was over there last week and there's no signage to indicate um, in and out, you know, it's being one way to the south and one way out to the north because somebody tried to, and they did, they went in on the north thing and they're like, well, there's no signage that says that they can't. That's, that's why. Yeah, so do not enter side like the village parking. I don't think that has been, like been established yet. Mm -mm. It hasn't been established yet. Once it's done, we'll have to have do not enter or one way right. and stuff like that, like the village parking lot has. What's the and, and somebody from the uh, public did say that there's a there's a bus uh, stop out front and it is there kind of like right in front so that's going to have to be moved somewhere. Is that officially identified? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's you know you got a Dutchess County Transportation you know pole there and they got a bench and it's like right in front of the the um, the existing Chamber of Commerce building so I mean. It could probably still stay there. Do you have I to mean, have access you know, to the curb to have a bus stop? Do you have a bus stop with a car parked in it? At the um, I don't know if it's if it's dedicated as a bus stop. I'd have to take a look, but that's 
something DOT needs to look into. That's why when they, when we send out for comment, they need to not just rubber stamp things and send them back. Okay. <laughs> They'll probably you know? keep the hands off because it's, it's loop. It's the county. Loop oh, it's county. Yes. Yeah, and then the loop bus, you can flag down the loop bus. There's, there's some so, formal, but mostly informal bus stops for that bus. Did we send this to the county for comment? We sent it to DC planning and development. I don't know how much interdepartmental communication they have because DC Loop is an entirely different uh, department. No, but we still sent it to the Dutchess County Planning Department. Yes, and they said it was a matter of local concern. Yeah. So, the, bus, right. the bus stops there, but it doesn't have a pull-in zone that's marked for a bus stop. The car's parked there, and they just stop in the lane, let people on, and then keep going. So they could park, they could stop anywhere along the you know, and normally buses like to stop on the far side of an intersection rather than on the short side of an intersection because um, it's easier. Um, they don't block traffic when the light's green. Right. Well, all right. Well, I guess. Uh, David, is the public hearing still open on that? Yes. Yes. We yeah, continue okay. The public still hearing. Open, so we'll continue with that. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. I'll see in two weeks. We might know who's president by then. Or <laughs> Maybe Bush, we will. Uh, Bush Gore went on for like three weeks or more. I, you know, so who knows? The world could be very different. And the, and the country survived the three weeks of Bush Gore. Yes. So we'll see what happens. We'll survive. So, uh, Good so luck to everybody, whoever you're rooting for. And uh, I'll see you all in two weeks. And we have, we'll have to have a meeting uh, like Monday or Tuesday to discuss the applications that come in by Friday for the uh, next meeting. With Mike. Yes, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll, I'll make, make that motion. <laughs> Mike, I'll second it. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Good luck, everybody. See you soon. Okay. Right. Yeah.